My name is Terry Dance Benink, and I'm with Vote PRBC, which is the proponent group in the upcoming referendum on electoral reform in BC. And when I'm out canvassing for proportional representation, or pro-rep for short, people often ask me, well, what's on the ballot? I think a growing number of people are aware of the referendum, but they want to know more. So I'm here today to explain three things. The first is the role of Elections BC and other referendum players. Secondly, what is on the ballot? And third, what do we mean by pro-rep? So let's start with Elections BC. They're in charge of running the campaign, and they will be sending out an information card to every BC household starting on September the 10th to make sure that we are all registered to vote. And then by mid-October, they're going to send us a comprehensive voter's guide, and that will be followed by, uh, on October 22nd, a ballot package, which will enable us to vote by mail. You'll have almost five weeks to make up your minds and to send in your ballot by November 30th. And Elections BC is basically going to focus on making sure we know how to vote, what the key dates are, and they're going to provide neutral information on the voting systems. In terms of how they're going to reach us, they're going to use radio, TV, uh, newspapers, digital, um, social media, and ethnic publications and stations as well. They're going to translate their voter guide into 14 different languages on their website, and they'll make sure that a copy is placed in every library in BC. So there'll be lots of information coming out. In terms of other players in the referendum, there's an official proponent group, which I represent today, called Vote PR BC. There's also an official opponent group called No. BC Proportional Representation Society. Other orgs, organizations can choose to register as third-party advertisers and abide by strict financial rules. And then there are plenty of other groups and community organizations that will communicate directly with their own members, and that's just fine. They don't need to register. So there's going to be lots of activity. What's on the ballot? Two questions, quite simple. First question basically asks us uh, which voting system do you think BC should use in provincial elections? A, our current first past the post voting system, or B, a proportional representation voting system? And so that's the most important question. The second one is optional, and it's for people who have an opinion on what type of proportional system they would most prefer. And here you have your choice of three systems and you can rank in order of your preference. You can choose one, two, three, or you can ignore question two altogether, having answered question number one. And just to be clear, before I name the three systems, they didn't just drop out of nowhere. They're based on a consultation that the Attorney General conducted last fall. 90,000 BC voters weighed in. I mean, that's the largest ever public consultation on this issue in decades. So, and that was the basis upon which the three systems were selected. And they are dual member proportional, mixed member proportional, and rural urban proportional. And to be clear, the proponent group, Vote PRBC, we do not um, recommend any one of those in particular. We think they're all good. They're all better than what we have now. And we're going to, we leave it up to voters to, to make up their mind. We have good descriptions for each one of them on our website, voteprbc.ca. And of course, you can go to Elections BC and they will have information as well. Lastly, what do we mean by proportional representation? Basically, it's a principle underlying a voting system, namely that people should be represented in proportion to how they vote. 
And so that means, for example, that if a party gets 30% of the popular vote, they get 30% of the vote, of the seats. And so, for example, that means that we will no longer see a single party getting a majority government with a minority of the popular vote. And that's been what we've been experiencing in BC now for decades. The other thing about pro-rep is that will in, it will ensure greater diversity in the type of MLAs we're able to elect. We'll be able to choose MLAs who reflect our political values, lessening the need for strategic voting. Every, represent, every region in BC will be represented in government and in the opposition, and local representation is guaranteed. Um, the other thing that, that we, I am really um, hopeful about with ProRep is that it will lead to greater cooperation and compromise amongst the parties. So we're going to see less of the bickering and the name calling that has happened in the past in the legislature because the parties will have to work together. The Attorney General has also stipulated that 5% is the threshold, so that can minimize the danger of any extremist or, or fringe parties. Um, he has also said that there can't be any big increase in the number of MLAs, so there's not going to be more costs. And lastly, we get another kick at the can. After two election cycles, we're going to get to vote again and say, you know, what we like or don't like about the system and what should, should, should be changed, if anything. And so basically with pro-rep, you get what you vote for. So I urge you to vote for democracy next October. Thanks. Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, August the 29th. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that puts this show together every couple of weeks. Uh, my guest in this segment is Dr. Tim Ball, and we're going to be talking about climate. So, Dr. Ball, how did you get into studying weather and climate in the first place? Well, I got into it because I was in the Canadian Air Force for nine years, and four years of that was chasing Russian submarines around the North Atlantic, and then five years of search and rescue in the Arctic. And uh, one of the things I had learned from that was the weather forecasting was terrible. I mean, most of the time they were they were 100 percent wrong, often to put it putting us in danger. For example, in the Arctic, you'd fly into an area they said was clear and you'd hit freezing rain and everything else. So after I lost my flying category because of hearing loss, um, I got a small cash settlement, decided to go back to university to try and study what was wrong with weather forecasting. Why was it so bad? And I, I just happened to um, uh, hit with a, a Professor Lamb uh, at the University of East Anglia. And um, I spent quite a bit of time with him. He was doing the same thing because he'd been forecasting during the war for bombers over Germany and they were complaining about how bad the forecasts were. And so what he had set up at East Anglia in, in England was a, a unit to study or reconstruct past climates. And the argument was that un until you understand how much the weather and climate changes over time and what the mechanisms are that are driving it, you can't possibly uh, come up with an accurate forecast. So I had the pleasure of working with him and then I, I ended up doing a, a PhD in historical climate, um, incidentally using the Hudson Bay Company records, uh, which are some of the best and longest weather records anywhere in the world. For example, they had thermometers and barometers at Churchill, Manitoba, as early as 1768. And, and it's not until you look at those long-term records that you start to realize how much the weather and climate changes and why they're so wrong with it all. Um, I think climate change is happening. I think it's human-caused. Um, and I think we're in big trouble. I'll ask you the same question. Is there climate change? Yeah, well, of course, it started out as global warming. That was the first uh, big scare was global warming. And then it changed to climate change in about 2004. And the reason that they changed, and the public noticed that, a lot of the, the media people noticed the change, they switched from talking about global warming because what they said was that if CO2 from human, and that's what they're blaming for causing global warming is, they said human uh, CO2 is causing the temperature to go up. 
But what happened after 1998 was that, that the CO2 continued to go up, but the temperature started to level off and go down. Okay. I'll just say I don't agree with you on that. But Well, on. just look at the official record. I'm not, I'm not telling you, uh, why would I sit here and lie to you? Look at the official record. If you, if you want, I would have brought the, char the chart with me and shown you that. I mean, uh, I've studied this stuff for 40 years, and I study it every day. And, and so what happened was, and by the way, we've got emails leaked from the University of East Anglia where they say, look, we're having a hard time selling the global warming issue because of we're getting snow and cold weather. Uh, aren't we better to call it climate change? So they switched it to climate change. Global warming was occurring. But what I was con uh, agree disagreeing with was that humans had any part in that warming. And then when they switch to climate change, of course, now that allows them to say any change is due to human cause. Um, I, of course, climate's changing. It's always changed. That's the point I made in my introductory comments about looking at the historic record. But just, just to give you an example, they're saying, oh, uh, there, there's reports saying, oh, it's the warmest right now that, it, that it's in 120,000 years. In fact, for the last 10,000 years, a period called the Holocene Optimum, it was warmer than today for 97% of that 10,000 years. And to give you another example. Can you, sorry, can you say that again? For 97% for of the last 10,000 years, a period called the Holocene Optimum, it, has, it was warmer for 97% of that time than it is today. 9,000 years ago, it was six degrees Celsius warmer today. The world was six degrees Celsius warmer. But there wasn't any human CO2 being added to that. But of course, be, unless you know the historic record and you know the extent of it and how much it varies, and that's the difficulty. You see, one of the things when they set up this group, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to investigate climate change, and that's become the official agency, they limited their research and they said, you only look at human causes of climate change. The problem with that is, unless you know how much ch climate is changing naturally and what the causes of it are, you can't possibly figure out what the human portion of that climate change is. Okay, that, that's- I'll just interject and say, once again, I disagree with you, but But, but well, give me some evidence. Sure, I'm giving you evidence for, okay. for why you're wrong. Let, okay. let me, let me, oh, let, me, let, me, let, me let me show you something else. Let they me, also let say- me just say that I just copied something here. It says, it's called, just, uh, just to show you this, it's called Consensus on Consensus, a synthesis of estimates on human-caused global warming. And this is put out by the IOP Publishing, which is the publishing company of the Institute of Physics, and which is a scientific charity that has a membership of 50,000 uh, physicists. And they say, the consensus that humans are causing recent global warming is shared by 90 to 100% of publishing climate scientists, according to six independent studies by co-authors of this paper. But so just, just to no, let but people but know see, that not everybody agrees no, no, with no, But they're, they're, they're immediately, you, sh you don't know what you're talking about because, and they don't know, because the word consensus does not apply to science. Einstein said, I can have 100 pieces of research show I'm right, one piece of research shows I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Consensus does not apply in science. So the use of the word consensus is a complete misleading and the fact that a, that a physics society are using the word consensus with regard to science shows how wrong they are. And the, the idea that 97% of the scientists agree, I would argue that 97% of scientists haven't even looked at the work that the IPCC have done. And uh, I haven't got it here, but um, people that go and look at the reports Nobody reads them. I'm sure you haven't read them. Absolutely when, not. No. When you look at those reports, and one guy, a German physicist, a meteorologist and physicist, he read it and he said, you know, I accepted everything they said. And then 10 years ago, I went and looked at what they were saying, and he said, I couldn't believe how false the information how much was and how much was left out. And the was point he I was talking about point, the people who opposed climate change or the people who supported the idea of climate I mean, change? He was talking about the science that they're presenting to argue that humans are causing global warming. No, I, I fully, look, you have every right to say that. I'm just saying that here is a group, the. Okay, but let, let, me, let me finish Institute my point. Of physics let me finish the point that I was trying to make. disagree let, with you and says. Let me finish the point I was trying to make before you interrupted me. It is me. shared by 90% or 200% of publishing climate science. Let me finish the point I was trying to make before you, you interrupted me. 
the, what they assume is that if CO2 goes up, the temperature goes up. Every single record, and I don't care what it is, at, from where, any time, any period, in every record we have, the temperature changes before the CO2. In other words, the fundamental assumption they make that an increase in CO2 will cause a temperature increase is wrong. But they built that into their computer models. The computer models say, if we increase CO2 in the computer model, the temperature goes up. Well, guess what? Every single prediction and forecast they've made with those computer models since 1990 has been wrong. Okay, I'll just if your for one second. No, no, I'll I'm just finishing. Read this. Let, no, I'll just read this. let me finish your. Let, let me finish so today, my point. 2018 let, is now the worst fire season on record. No, that's an, that's an absolute. As British Columbia extends state of emergency, I'm just stating, you know, just reading a headline. Go and look at the sediments in the Pacific Ocean off the off the coast of California, or, and you can look at them here. You'll see the layers of carbon where there's been grass fires and forest fires, and the number have de decreased since Europeans arrived. Go and look at the Hudson Bay Com uh, Company records, as I have, where in 1790 they, they've got comments like the Indians report the whole of the prairies on fire. People forget that there were massive fires and there was nobody to put them out. None of that gets recorded. Okay. But let me finish my point about the CO2 increase. In their computer models, they say if CO2 increases, the temperature goes up. Every single prediction or forecast they've been made has been wrong. If you want to define science in one word, it's the ability to predict. If your predictions are wrong, your science is wrong. But they still keep telling you, oh, we know what we're doing, but every single prediction they've made has been wrong. Okay. And here's, of course, that's why they changed the, the term from global warming to climate change because their, uh, their, their uh, hypothesis that a CO2 increase would cause a temperature increase wasn't working for them. Okay. So they, is, they moved the goalposts. This is from the government of Canada. Oh, it my says, goodness. I know, I don't believe the oh. government of Canada either, but just, just, to, just to repeat what they're saying. Yeah. It says, uh, what is the most important cause of climate change? Human activity is the main cause of climate change. Burning fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide, okay. a greenhouse gas. Let now, me stop you there. The, oh wait. No, no, let me stop you. Don't stop me. Let me, me, no, stop me. Let stop. me say one more sentence. All right, one more sentence. This is the official position of the government of Canada. Oh, my, 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 oh, oh hello. I know, oh, I never believe them on anything, but I okay, choose to for, believe them first here. Of, first of all, what are the greenhouse gases? You see, there's three major greenhouse gases. Water vapor, CO2, and methane. They don't even mention water vapor. But water vapor is 95% of the greenhouse gases. CO2 is only 4%. And the human portion of that is 0.04%. It's, it's nothing. But they ignore water vapor. Why? Because remember earlier I said to you what was the definition they were given of climate change? They were told to only look at human causes of climate change. So they said, oh, well, yes, humans produce water vapor and put it in the atmosphere, but the amount we put up relative to the amount that's there is so little, it's not significant. Now, there are many things. But, no, but let me okay, finish okay, okay. my point, okay. please. Hey, finish your point. 95% of the water vapor or of the greenhouse gases is water vapor. They assume that it doesn't change, but you've only got to change water vapor content by 2% and it equals all of the CO2 changes that, that occur. So the fact that you leave out, the, it's, it's like looking at your car and saying, well, my car's not running very well, but I'm going to ignore the engine and the transmission. That's exactly what they're doing. And of course, this whole thing was set up through Environment Canada. In fact, the Assistant Deputy Minister, Gordon McBean of Environment Canada, chaired the founding meeting of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is deep state at work. It was done through the bureaucracies and they convinced the politicians and of course, they block science. What I they've done- I would say the deep state is doing the other thing. I would say the deep state are the ones who are pretending there has not been for the last- No, 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 no. Hundreds of not years- Not true at all. No, because no, it's the bureaucracy. Don't they represent the oil industry? No, it's the industry? bureaucracy. Isn't the deep state no, the oil that, industry? That's why, the car do you know industry? who set up the IPCC? Who organized all this? No. Morris Strong. Do you know who Morris Strong is? I remember the name from many years ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Morris Strong was a member of the Club of Rome and he was the one that went to the United Nations, and you can read about it in Elaine Dewar's book, Cloak of Green. Elaine Dewar, who was a really good journalist in the old days of old-fashioned journalism, she wanted to write a book in praise of Canadian environmentalists like, like uh, Maurice Strong and David Suzuki and Elizabeth May. The more research she did on the book, the more she found out they were as corrupt as the people that they were attacking. So she wrote a book called Cloak of Green. She spent five days with Maurice Strong at the United Nations where he was setting up this program through the bureaucracies because he knew if he controlled the bureaucracies he could control the politicians. And Environment Canada have been at the forefront of this 
and as I said, go and look at the science. You, 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 even, you hardly let me talk about the science. I, would have, I could have brought you all the graphs and showed you. Next time. Well, hopefully, uh, I'm, not even so, I'm not even sure because, uh, as I said, giving me 15 minutes to talk about a, a huge global issue where the world, it's the biggest deception in history. There's no question about that. The argument that humans, humans than, and human CO2. Bigger than 9-11? <laughs> sorry? Bigger than 9-11? Oh, far bigger. Okay. Because it's ha affected the whole world. That's why they chose global warming as the, as the issue, because they wanted to transcend na nation states and saying that no one nation can deal with this. We need a global government to deal with it. That's what it was all about. I and mean, I would say the opposite, but. Well, that's, that's your privilege. But as I said, I, I'd be happy to bring in all the documentation. And if you want to give me an hour, I'd be very happy to answer all your questions and, and to explain what, what's being said in these things. And as I say, consensus has nothing to do with science. We only have a minute left. One last thing. This, uh, this consensus paper says that between 90 to 100 percent of publishing climate scientists uh, agree with the idea of climate change and global warming. Do you have any peer-reviewed papers on this subject that we can look into? Do I have any? Yes. Yes, I do. I have about 23 peer review papers, okay. but most of my career, I, I retired in 1996, but I've continued to publish and write about this and written books about it. But yeah, I have peer reviewed is papers. But let me, let me tell you something. One title? The group, if this is in the, the emails that were leaked from the people that were controlling the IPCC from the University of East Anglia. And the emails were leaked in 2009, November 2009. And what they were doing was they got editors fired who dared to publish articles that they didn't agree with. That's what's been going on in the climate, in the climate area. And you can, the listeners can look that up. It's called Climate Gate. Yes, and so when, when they argue that, oh, peer-reviewed papers, peer review is the biggest scam going. You, you, the, editor, the editor sends it to the high priest of the prevailing wisdom, and if it doesn't agree with the prevailing wisdom, oh, don't publish. So there's peer review censorship, editorial censorship goes on. Peer review is, is a joke. It's a bunch of people amongst themselves agreeing with each other and publishing each other's stuff. And, and uh, all they do it for is to get, get promotion and get tenure. But 99% of what comes out of universities is a total waste of time. Dr. Timbaugh, thank you very much. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. My name is Terry Dance Benink, and I'm known for my energy and enthusiasm. And in fact, my friends have a nickname for me, which is Terry the Terrier. And in the last year or two, they've been at me saying, why are you so keen on proportional representation? You know, isn't that for policy wonks and nerds and it's boring? And I must confess, a few years ago when I ran into Wendy Bergerud, who was the leader of Fair Vote Canada's Victoria chapter, um, I, w I felt intimidated. She was a statistician, and I am not a great lover of figures and complicated graphs. But I do love justice. And in fact, I get really upset when I see someone being discriminated against or when I see whales being sacrificed for more pipelines, just to give two examples. And I think I follow in my mother's footsteps. I mean, she had justice in her bones. She fought for civil rights for decades. She was a Catholic. I'm a United Churcher. There you have it. But I'm 70 now, and I'm getting tired of the endless parade of causes, you know, be it trying to stop the expansion of tankers or the growth of the tar sands or to defend First Nation rights. And as an elder, I've also faced my own health challenges. I'm a cancer survivor. And I want the politicians to hear my voice and expand access to medically assisted dying, for example. But will they, you know, before it's too late for me and for countless other people? So what I've come to realize in the last couple of years is that all these injustices stem in part from our voting system. Our first past the post voting system is based on a winner take all mentality, not a spirit of compromise and cooperation in the service of the greatest common good. And in fact, I was shocked when I learned from Wendy 
that in the last 18 elections in BC, 17 of them were won by parties who gained a majority with a minority of the popular vote. You know, so most votes didn't count. Most people didn't get the MLAs that they voted for. And to me, that's just wrong. It's not fair. And so I say it's a justice issue. It's a civil rights issue, in fact. I mean, we have the technical right to vote, but if a majority of votes don't really count, something is really, really wrong. And let's face it, MLAs do have power. We can't afford to say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to sit it out. Um, they do have the power to make decisions about the issues that really matter to me, that matter to you. And if I don't see people that look like me and talk like me in the legislature, what chance do I really have of seeing real change? So that's why I'm on the front line of bringing ProRep to BC along with thousands of other people. I'd like us to join the 90 other democracies in the world who are using ProRep and have been using it for decades. And not one of them has chosen to go back to a winner-take-all uh, voting system. And I think that says something. But I'm under no illusion that it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be a really tough battle because the entrenched interests in our society, the, those who are wealthy and those who are used to having unilateral power are not going to give up without a fight. And I think there's a lot at stake. Do we want to see a Doug Ford elected in BC in three years' time or a Donald Trump? And that could happen. Though both of those men were elected under a first the past, first past the post voting system. So and that would make me just shudder to think of that happening in BC. So I really urge you to be sure to vote this fall. Um, Become passionate, like me, about pro-rep. Think about what you really love and treasure. And vote for democracy this October. Thank you. Welcome back. Our guest in this segment is Will Smith. And we're going to be talking about people want to do the right thing. Will? Yes, well, last, uh, last week I... Uh, I was talking about my own uh, upbringing was sort of a conservative Republican upbringing and, and conservatives, you know, the wisdom of conservatism is that when things are going, you don't need to, going along, you don't need to change them just to change them. And so it's sort of guaranteed that society won't have any abrupt changes. But in the time that we're going through right now with the abrupt, I mean, we're still, the changes are accelerating in technology, all sorts of different situations are accelerating. And, uh, and the problem is that our political system isn't changing to accommodate this. Uh, as as uh, one of the people that I uh, like to quote is an ex-RCMP, a retired RCMP fellow. He says that uh, the systems that we have are not capable of responding to change at a fast enough rate. And they can't keep up. And so they're just running on inertia. And we're trying to fix that by doing proportional representation. But still, the basic problem is, is that our, our, our big organizations, our big, uh, the, the things that run our society, the foundations, are not changing fast enough. And we can see that there are vested interests in not changing. So the politicians get elected to, to fix things, but they don't do it. But at the lowest level, people want to do the right thing. So in Russia right now, for example, we're seeing that uh, they're giving away two and a half hectare plots of land to families so that they'll create a, what they call a kin domain, which is in effect a homestead. And these are sustainable and self-sufficient. And this is something that's come about in Russia probably due to necessity because of the system that they had. But now also this month, they just passed a new rule that uh, people have the right to build anything they want on their land 
and that the, all they have to do is notify the local authorities instead of going through a committee or zoning or anything like that. And the reason this makes sense is because people want to save the planet at an individual level. People are, I mean, you can hear everybody's appalled at what's going on uh, at, this, at the lowest level. We're, and, and we get a story from the politicians that they're, they're working on it. We sign accords, and, but we still bought a, a pipeline and we're still building a dam. And the same kind of, we could do the same kind of thing. When I went to the immigration office here uh, to get my permanent resident card, for example, they had these old posters from 100 years ago on uh, the homestead. They would give you 160 acres, and if you worked it for five years, it was yours. Canada still has plenty of land, so we could make a program that would give people two and a half hectares, certainly, to take care of. You know, well, that would be a wonderful idea, and we really should do that. And, you know, here in, here in B.C., there's huge amounts of crown land. It's all controlled by uh, the, log, the big logging companies, the oil industry. I mean, they, they have their claws on it. But if some of that land was freed up, I mean, it could be given to people. We could reform towns. And if we set up our economy so that you could make a living running a relatively smallish family farm again, like you used to be able to do, right. and which you can do in many other countries, <coughs> then we could begin to build, I think, a better society. I do, too. And I, I think that, you know, we've had people on the, on the show here. There are people who have the, the desire and the willpower to do this, but in this instance, the government is running, effectively running interference. And I mean, we can just go to the example of the uh, Fernwood eco-village that we saw. And this was a group of, and, and you know, these people weren't radicals. They were, they were people who just wanted to have a, a nice uh, place to retire. And it was a little oh, bit yeah. higher. So the Fernwood eco-village was like a little co-op housing plan. Right. Yeah, the Her Fernwood Urban Village, that's yeah. what it was a, called. A small co-op housing plan put together by a couple of people and as I recall, which is probably what you were about to say, they got bogged down with city council and we watched big, horrible developments that nobody in the neighborhood wanted Just come and get approved and right. away they went and they got built. But this little thing, which was really a nice small co-op housing thing, would not be allowed through the process because our rulers don't want that kind well, of they stuff. Well, did, they did finally get it through, but by, the problem was it took... I don't know, four or five years, and by the time, uh, by the time they got it approved, uh, some of the people had left. I think one fellow died. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it just wasn't a good situation. It but just went the, on but what I, I just want to say is that you know people want to do the right thing, but but we have these barriers in place so that that, that can't change. And so, you know, I, I don't think that that's a good time to be a conservative. I think that right now the best thing we can do is is let people be who they are and you know come to come to grips with some of these problems and develop solutions and another example of this is hemp and uh, you know we could be using hemp for plastics for fuel for all sorts of different things but there are obviously a lot of vested interests in the way of doing that and we still have laws that are prohibitive now I understand that there are this is changing and that they're not gonna they're gonna allow people to uh, harvest the entire hemp plant and these are these are good signs. I, I'd like to see some more of that, though. So, uh, I'm all for the the proportional representation thing. I just I, I just <laughs> I just wonder if the answers aren't going to come from somewhere else. So I'm looking I'm looking around the world. I like what I see in in Russia in that, and I'm going to keep tabs on that because this is the government is just having to say, okay, we're going to let you do this. I, I don't think that they're that the government I, wants to really, I mean, I think the government there really wants to keep control, but they have this problem of people leaving Russia. And so they're trying to keep people from leaving by giving them some kind of a reason to stay, an incentive. I think proportional representation will give us more of the government we want, which will empower us to do the things we want. I think that's one thing PR will do. And I think that, uh, although I'm, I've never been a, a conservative based on political parties, hopefully people who are conservatives can get right into all this stuff as well because it, it relates to them and what they want as much as to anybody else. Even though you're right, change is happening, but I think conservatives can embrace change if it's going in a conservative direction, which is to conserve. We're out of time. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Report.
Welcome back. My guest in this segment is Jeff Hendry, and we're going to start by talking about what's going on with one of our favorite roads, the Malahat. Yes, hi. Hey, Jeff, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, the Malahat. I'm just a few things about me. I live in Victoria for now because I go to Camosun College, but my parents live up in Duncan Schmiss area. So every now and then, if they want to go on a vacation, say like you know Cuba or even just the mainland for like a Vancouver weekend trip, like you know, hey, can you come up and feed the animals or take oh, care of the okay. cats for a bit? So being the favorite son, I guess you could say, I'll wait. sure, I'll come up. But yeah, every now and then I have to like, okay, what time can I go up? I can't really go up around five. Three o'clock is kind of pushing it because, you know, come from Victoria to Duncan, there's the traffic, or sorry, the Colwood crawl, they call it. And then maybe construction on the Mount Hat itself will slow you down. So it could turn into about like, almost a two and a half hour trip sometimes. If, of course, not playing accordingly. Or even I just want to go out for a day trip, something like that, or. Just strike so away from the city. It's I drive difficult. the Malahat maybe once a year. Okay. So I have no idea what it's like, really. Mm. I mean, I know that there are, it seems, a lot of accidents there, some of them very serious, and oh, the road yes, gets yes. closed down for hours. Mm -hmm. Everybody's angry, and there's talk about building a new road. But what's it like to drive the Malahat? Do you feel, do you feel it's a safe road to drive? Ooh, it's kind of a big question because I've been sort of there driving up and down the Malahat before the big construction has happened on it. Okay. Um, I find that times it is safe. Of course, when the rains happen after a long summer dryness, uh, they can become slippery if you're not too careful, if you're not paying attention. Um, if you're late at night as well, there might be the possibility of drivers who are going a little too fast or not really paying attention or maybe are a bit sleepy they can also play a factor too which could lead to an accident now and then a few times i've like um driven up there and maybe some person didn't really see me in the rearview mirror or something like that and the, you know cut me off accidentally or the merges too sometimes people are a little unsure i think of how to properly get into the next lane when a merge happens there can be some confusion there and in that case some panic now, my recollection head. is it's one lane for a lot of it and two lanes in places am I, am I uh yeah for the most part through Goldstream itself it's yeah. sort of one lane until you get like a little up the mountain itself and then with new construction they've added I believe four more lanes until about the Shawnigan Lake turnoff okay. and then it's back to a single and double lane again now on CFAX radio, which I listen to too much, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they'll often talk about it. And when people phone in, the number one message that I hear seems to be, from, just from people who phone in, the road isn't that bad, it's the drivers. Mm. So, I mean, just driving around town, I would have to agree with that. Right. But when you go on a road that's <laughs> a little more dangerous and high speed, then I'd probably agree with it even more. Mm -hmm. So would you kind of agree with what I'm hearing or is that? I can see where they're coming from and I do think about this quite a bit because coming from Duncan to Victoria, there's not as much as say like, you know, traffic jams or as heavy a traffic, except for maybe like on a Sunday when everyone's trying to get back to work or something like that. But coming from Victoria to Duncan, I think, cause the call would crawl obviously, like I said before, People are like, you know, oh, I'm like, you know, going 30 minutes late now. I, I got to pick up speed somewhere. The Malahat is really the only place for the side to pick up the pace. And that can sometimes turn consequential. Is tailgating a problem on the Malahat? Um, depends on the drive. Oh, of course. It, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I think it depends on exactly how bad of uh, temper I suppose or how rushed people feel because you know everyone is different yeah. everyone drives different pace or to their own comfort of course and yeah it's uh, <laughs> one of those additional stresses I guess you could say so the uh, one alternative to the Malahat is trains mm -hmm. we have a track that runs not only to Duncan but all the way up the island yeah back when I was a kid it used to be open and I took it three times to my memory yeah and I think I took it maybe once many, many, many years ago, but okay. I'm not even sure. So would that be a viable alternative, do you think? I think for like, at least for me, 
like, you know, just go out for the weekend or something like that, or even just like for the day if I had to meet my parents for something or if I forgot something up there, it would definitely be a good option. Wouldn't it be nice if there were trains like every 10 minutes? That's what I would think yeah. too, especially for those who had to like work in Victoria but had to come from Duncan, yeah, that also yeah, adds yeah. to the congestion of the traffic. So if there could be at least another alternative to somehow, I don't know, break down this congestion, it might help on the Malhat a bit more. Or even just have a, another road when it does become blocked from accidents or had to close it down for a bit. Because, um, what was it, a few months ago actually when there was another bad accident in the Malahat, I had to go up to Duncan, as again, for a bit of a trip. I was going to go to Fino. But a few hours to when I was about to leave, I heard about the Malahat being closed down and like everything was closed. The ferry was booked up. I couldn't really go anywhere. The only alternative would have been to go to the Salt Spring, take the ferry there all the way to Crofton, or go all the way the old Port Renfrew route, you know, through Souk, that whole direction. I've heard about that route. Yeah, How yeah. long does it take to... For me, it took about... Well, you did, you did it? I did, I did, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Because uh, apparently, by coincidence, my friend was coming back from Alberta that day, and they flew in, and they had no way to get back home that night, and they had to feed their animals. So <laughs> being the good person I was, like, okay, come with me. We'll, we'll brave the route. And yeah, we did the whole thing. It took us roughly about almost five hours, give or take. And, oh, it was a long, long trip. Yeah, we left about six o'clock and I finally got to my parents' place around 11 that night. So I'm long a big day. believer in trains. I would, I would like to see trains running in the city and trams. Oh, and, same here, yes. Yeah, yes. I'd like to see trains going up the island. I mean, a, a friend and I were thinking of going to Courtney and one of the reasons I didn't go was I just thought, what a waste of gas, you know, to, to, to drive all that way. If we had a train, it could be nice. I mean, it could be great. I know in Europe, although I haven't been to Europe for decades, but <laughs> it works. In, in Japan, it works. Everywhere in the world, it works. Right, yeah. But for some reason, we can't have trains here. I, I, I don't know why. Our, our governments will not allow it, so we're stuck. I've heard rumors that, at least for the Malahat, their excuse is that the trestle itself needs to be um, repaired or at least rebuilt in some areas because there's been no act oh, sorry, lack of activity for anything. It's been almost, like, what, 20 years, I think, since the last train went over, I believe? I don't think it's that long. Oh, but okay. Well, in my mind, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it would definitely, like I said before, I think it would definitely help to reduce the traffic amount. Yeah, yeah. And as I've been told when I was learning to drive, the most dangerous part about being a driver is actually being on the road. So the less time you're on the road, less danger you're oh, in. Here's, here's a road question. Ah, what do you think it. of photo radar? <sighs> it's, it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately for me, I try to plan my driving time on the road reasonably well so I won't have to like be in a rush to get anywhere but for other people especially for those you know who are you know maybe stuck behind traffic or didn't plan their time out well I can definitely see how that would be a, a problem for them. Yeah I can remember when we got photo radar in many many years ago it slowed the whole city down which mm. was nice. Jeff we're out of time. Okay. Thank right. you very much. Okay thank you for having me. Yeah and thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's Wednesday, August the 29th. My guest in this segment is Sebastian Sutter. Uh, Sebastian's a student at Camosun College, and we're going to talk about the program. Just start off by talking about the program you're in, which is called... Live Event and Audiovisual Technician. Live Event program. and Audiovisual Technician. So what, what does the program cover? Um, basically, what's covered in it is... Um, yeah, it's stuff to do with um, like stagecraft, so on like theater and uh, and concert stages, putting all that together, managing a show, um, and then uh, cinematography in like a TV and sort of film context like pretty much what I've actually been doing here volunteering for Shaw. Right. So I mean what goes on here the stuff I do is very simple I just sit down and talk but the 
technical part of it yeah. is, I think, very difficult. Yeah. Are you familiar with all of that from, is that what, what the program teaches you from A to Z, the editing, the filming? The exactly, yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so, film, yep, uh, video editing, um, cinematography, yeah, as I said, uh, and then just, yeah, more, uh, yeah, actually down to lighting, too. Um, and the most yeah. important thing, which is the sound. And, yeah, audio, yeah, design. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm pretty well familiar. There are still, like, I, maybe, a, I mean, there's always room to, for improvement everywhere. Um, but, yeah, generally, I'm confident uh, in, like, everything that, I, that I've done. Well, I think it's very useful and important skill to have, especially in this day and age where we so desperately need access to what's really going on in the world. So I'm glad. Yeah. I know the program used to exist at Camosun. It disappeared for a number of years. I didn't know it was back, so I'm glad that it is. Yeah. Yeah, and well, with uh, more, like it seems to be that there's more, uh, that there's more um, like music festivals in that. Uh, right, so you can do the sound and et cetera for those. City. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so. Like All I can say about music festivals and sound is please turn it down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for those of us who happen to live around them. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, and case in point, I'm actually going to be working uh, at uh, Rifflandia in uh, a couple weeks. Let's not even talk about that. <laughs> Um, you know, but I will say, I wonder why, I, me I remember the first one a few, several years ago when the entire city, they got thousands of complaints about the noise. And I really wonder why our city government is so uncaring about something like that. I mean, do you like to disturb thousands of people who happen to live even miles away? It's absolutely crazy. But you wanted to talk a little bit about either the referendum on proportional representation that's mm. coming up or local politics. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I mean, to some degree, I think uh, those are going to be going a bit more hand in hand now, hopefully. Like, I mean, of course, assuming, um, assuming the referendum passes favorably, which I really hope it would, uh, it would, uh, I, if it again, and again, assuming if it does, it would um, empower a great deal of uh, a great deal of younger people, like my generation, younger and a little bit older than me, to um, feel I, I hope kind of dispat like just disillusioned with uh, the current direction. And you should be. Yeah, absolutely. We all should be. It's yeah. it's a pathetic disgrace the way our governments operate. I do think that if we, if we can get proportional representation, it will give us a little more control over our governments, and it'll let us vote for who we want to vote for. Exactly. They'll just more closely resemble what, well, sort of how we are, how we live. I mean, they cannot if they're so the referendum is this fall. Yeah. I don't know if people at Camosun are talking about it or have been talking about it, but what's your take? Is it, do you think it will pass or do you think it, it's going to be close? Or? Because the optimist in me hopes it will. Um, unfortunately, um, I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't quite say if uh, 100% if it will or not. I, yeah, I think all I can do, all we can all do really is hope and, hope and, and vote. And vote. And vote, and exactly. Vote. <laughs> Sebastian, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It is Wednesday, August the 29th. I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Uh, Will, what are we going to be talking about? Well, we've got a wide variety of topics. Uh, I think uh, Site C is a, is a good one. <laughs> so you start. Okay. <laughs> 
you know, Site C has kind of been pushed off the map, unfortunately. It is a disaster for this province of the first magnitude in, in, in terms of both, both environmental catastrophe and economic cost. And it is not surprising to me that the NDP government, John Horgan, decided to proceed with Site C because I think that's the sad reality of the way things really run in British Columbia and in Canada. It's all phony. I don't think the NDP, the leader, the mem I'm a member of the NDP. The membership of the NDP does not want Site C. The leadership of the NDP is completely separated from the membership and it's completely separated from the public. The leadership of all the big political parties, I don't want to pick on the NDP, the Liberals, the Conservatives, uh, all the big parties in Canada, the leadership works for big business. Corporate Canada runs our country. Corporate Canada wants Site C. And so, but the NDP has to exist because people on the left, such as myself, have to think that we have a political party that represents us. Because if we don't, then we'll, we may want to start a, another political party that really represents us. So for 15 years, when the NDP was in opposition, they opposed Sight C. They were there waving the flags and on the paddling and saying all the right stuff. But when they came into government, Sight C proceeds. It's got nothing to do with John Horgan. I'm sure John Horgan is a nice guy, but we have to deal with the reality of our political situation in Canada, which is that we're not a democracy. Big business runs the country, and until we can get hold of our democracy and take it over and create the free press that a democracy needs as well, this is going to keep happening to us. And we're signing petitions and writing letters to the editor. They just laugh. You know, nobody cares. Well, I'm uh, I'm optimistic about this situation, but me too. It's, it's probably not going to be. It's probably not going to be what, you know, the the same way you see it. Uh, the the thing I'm optimistic about is, first of all, they can't destroy the whole planet. So I mean, they may they may get away with doing Site C, but there's still a lot of really pristine, beautiful places. So I, I'm I'm optimistic about that. But the thing that that's uh, I guess the most disturbing thing to me is that. This isn't happening in a vacuum in Canada. I mean, there are lots of there are lots of power construction problems, uh, programs uh, being done in the world, and a lot of them are solar or there are alternative energy. And uh, it, you know, in general, people are trying to get away from nuclear power and towards more sustainable power. <laughs> so, so the thing is that I wonder about is just looking at looking at uh, BC Hydro's uh, financials. And they've already got a pretty big load of debt. And uh, adding this to it, I just don't understand how they can uh, see how they're going to pay that back. Because uh, it's a, it's a long-term debt. And uh, <clears throat> the thing about it is that uh, we're at a point, <clears throat> once again, we're at this point where technology is changing so fast. I was watching a presentation on YouTube saying that in a couple of years now, it's going to be totally affordable for people to buy solar panels to, to, uh, for their own house. And they, they won't need, I mean, the financing will be provided and everything. So how does, I just wonder, who's going to pay for this? I mean, is it going to turn into some kind of a boondoggle where BC Hydro has to be bailed out because nobody wants their stuff? So, I mean, I, this is what I don't get about the situation. I, I just, it boggles my mind. And once again, I see this is, the government's stuck in this, they can't move. Well, they could move because the government really has the power to do whatever they want. Yeah, but, but they're not going to because no, there are these vested to. interests and there are all sorts of, this guy owes this guy a favor and I don't know how it all works, but we heard a little bit about that on the last show about the you know, money changing hands and uh, in uh, poker gambling chips and stuff like that. So uh, I just wonder who's gonna pay for it. Well, I think the plan is that we are going to pay for it. Um, I think the, the, the plan is to create the debt for all of us and then do to us what they're doing to Greece, which is essentially privatize the country. 
I mean, Greece, all the ports, the airports, their water, everything in Greece is being privatized. That's the price the Greek people are paying because they're the, they were the low-hanging fruit. I don't think Canada is that far back because we are massively in debt. Interest rates are going to start going up. They plan to just destroy us and take everything and send us back to the times of the kings and queens and, uh, and the, the times of Robin Hood when, when there were the aristocracy and the peasants and we are going to be the peasants, whoever we are. I think that's the plan. I hope, now I'm optimistic, I hope we can fight them off, but they are so well organized and they have all the money and they have all the power. They control all the governments and they own all the media. All we are is a bunch of disorganized saps down here trying to do our best. So God help us. <laughs> but if we have, if we have uh, our own power, our own way of obtaining power, we don't really need that. And we don't have to have a smart meter then. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why this dinosaur could be on his way out. Yes, yes. Let's, let's hope we move in, let's hope we move in positive directions. Oh, I think we will. I mean, I think it's baked into the cake right now that, that the technology is, this disruptive technology is going to eclipse the, you know, all these, some of these environmental problems. I don't know how we're going to clean it up, but. Good question. Will, thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.